Joey Mazzarino started as a puppeteer on Sesame Street in 1989. He'd go on to perform characters such as Murray Monster, Stinky the Stinkweed, and Horatio the Elephant. He joined Sesame Street's writing staff in 1991 and would become head writer on the show in 2009. He also co-wrote the screenplays for The Adventures of Elmo and Grouchland and Muppets from Space. I talked to Joey Mazzarino about his career in puppetry and writing for puppets on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Well, Joey Mazzarino, welcome to Under the Puppet. Thank you, Grant. It's good to be here. Hello. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm, I'm glad that our, our mutual friend, Kevin Clash, kind of put us in touch. Oh, yeah. Kevin's the best. He's, he's, he's so, awesome. He's, he's good at uh, get, getting me work always. <laughs> Uh, do you remember your first exposure to puppetry as a kid, the first time you saw puppets? So, Grant, I was so um, naive about puppets. Like, I didn't know anything about puppets. I mean, I, I loved the Sesame Street puppets, but I really, this is how much I didn't know about puppets. I, my dad took me to see Empire Strikes Back, and I knew, like, you know, Kenny Baker was inside R2-D2, and Anthony, Dan, uh, Anthony Daniels was in C-3PO from the first movie. So when I came out of Empire Strikes Back, I was riding in the car with my dad, and I said, wow, that Frank Oz must be really small if he was able to fit inside that Yoda costume. <laughs> like, I, because there was that one scene where he ran, I'm like, I just assumed Yoda was a costume. That's how much I knew about puppetry as a, as a young kid. It wasn't until I was older that I really got into puppetry. Actually, it wasn't until I visited Sesame Street for the first time that I was like, oh my God, puppetry, is a, this is a thing? People do this for a living? This is amazing. So yeah. Well, uh, maybe not puppetry related, but were you creative as a kid? Did you have creative pursuits growing up? Um, I wanted to be an actor. I really wanted to act. I, like I discovered acting in high school. I went to an all boy uh, high school and um, I wanted to meet girls. And a friend said, well, you know, try the plays because we bring in girls from other schools. And I was like, all right, I'll try that because I was uh, just wanted to meet girls. And then I wound up lo like <laughs> loving it. I was like, oh, my God, this not only did it. You know, it's the, it's the first thing that, to me, where I'm like, oh, my God, these are my people. This is my tribe. This is a bunch of weirdos. Like, just like the Muppet Show. Like, this is the weirdos I want to hang out with. And, and then actually creating characters and performing just hooked me right away. So that's when I, high school is when I sort of got the creative bug. And were your parents creative at all? My dad was creative when I was a kid. He was an art director. He was an artist. He started off, like, during the Mad Men era. He worked in advertising. So I recently like in the last few years i found he he brought out his um his portfolio of all his work of like all these ads and funny and funnily enough he had um he did an ad for the first sesame street album because he worked for columbia records at the time so he did all creative stuff when i was really young he was an art director and an advertising guy and then he was a director of like industrial films and stuff so he would take me on sets and he let me do the little clapper and stuff <laughs> for that so that, that's where i first started getting into it but then by the time i got older he had gotten out of the business he was then just working for mercedes selling cars <laughs> so yeah there was a little creativity there and, and you said you wanted to be an actor did that inform your choice like when you went to college it did actually so i i was um and, and college is what led me directly to Muppets. I had gotten in with the, the acting crowd at my school and my friends and I all auditioned for Tisch School of the Arts. And I was the only one who got in. But my friend Joe convinced me. He said, no, you should come to Fordham because you'll be like, if you go to Tisch, you're going to be this small fish in this really big pond. But Fordham, we could go there and rule the school. And I was like, hey, you're right. And you'll be there and it'll be great. So I was like, I'm going to go to Fordham. And the first year of, uh, of Fordham, uh, ask me how many shows I got in Grant. How many shows did you get? I got get zero, in Grant. I tried out for everything <laughs> and I made zero. And I was so mad at Joe. And I was like, this is the worst decision <laughs> I ever made. And then I like the sophomore year I tried out, didn't really get in much. And then in between sophomore and junior year, uh, summer job, I was dating this girl and her dad worked for New York telephone and all her brothers were going to work for the phone company. And he asked me, do you want to work for the phone company for the, for the summer? And I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to do that. That seems manly. I want to do that. And I wound up getting the job as a telephone repairman. And because it's a utility, they made me work 
as many hours as they could. I was working like 60 hour weeks up on telephone poles and fixing phones. And I literally, at the end of that, at the end of that time, I was like a crazy Scarlett O'Hara, like I will never work blue collar again. <laughs> and I just made it my mission. Like I'm going to get in every show in junior year. And I did that. I got in every show in junior year, starting with the Shakespeare. And then like, I, I just worked, worked, worked. And that's how I met um, a puppeteer through, 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 um, through doing the work. She was a friend of uh, my, my professor at college, Ben Harney, who won the Tony for Dream Girls. He was my acting professor. And he was great friends with this woman, Camille Benora. And Camille was a puppeteer at Sesame Street and also an amazing improv comic. And she had come in to teach a class. And that's how I met her. And one day she said, do you want to meet Jim Henson? Do you want to come visit the set? And I was like, yes, I do. I do. And that, uh, that's how I got to visit Sesame for the first time. And what was that? Uh, what was that first visit like? Was uh, insane because I, you re- you met Jim there, right? I met Jim, and uh, I was uh, like, it's pretty much like the first famous person I ever met, really. And I was totally was not prepared to meet him because I was a huge Muppet Show fan, and um, even though I didn't know puppetry, I just loved his work and the Muppets and Sesame Street. Growing up on Sesame Street. And I just remember babbling, like I just did not know what to say to him. And I just remember being so nervous when I met him. Um, but I had no, I didn't go in there thinking anything about puppetry, but watching that day, it, it was a Muppet insert bit where it wasn't, you know, they weren't shooting a street story. They were shooting the Muppet inserts. Maybe they did three or four sketches and meeting Jim was awesome, but actually watching Richard Hunt, um, Richard was, um, I don't know. You, do you know who Richard is or was? Of course. Of okay. Course, so yeah. Richard was there and Richard that day, I think he did a cowboy and a butler and maybe a letter. And I just watched that guy. And he was, not only was he like hysterically, he was cracking up the crew in between shots and in, in between scenes, but his, like he was doing all these characters. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. You could be the same person and do all these different characters. And I was like, this is something I'm really interested in. I actually, I not only interested, I want to be Richard Hunt. I left there going, I want to be that guy. That's how do I get to be that guy? So then I became obsessed after that visit. I went to Camille and I was like, how do people do this? And she said, oh no, you know, a lot of these guys do it all their lives. It's really hard. I was like, just give me anything. She said, well, here's a tip. Just if you're, if you're doing lip sync, just drop, drop your thumb. Don't make your hand move up in the top. Just really relax and drop the thumb. And uh, I just then started doing this when I talked to anybody, moving my hand and trying to drop my thumb with every syllable. So I left there totally obsessed. And you started uh, building too, right? I did. You started building after, the, after that visit, I, I went to uh, the costume shop at Fordham, actually. And I went to the head of the costume department. I said, can I, can I just take fabric and try? I want to make my own puppets. And he's like, take what you want. And, and I just took anything I could find. Like I took like the styrofoam wig heads and fur and, and anything that they had that I could possibly make a puppet out of. I took and I started really obsessively um, obsessive to the point that my parents were worried that something was wrong with me. Cause I'd come home from school. Cause I lived at home. I didn't live at school. I'd come home from school. I'd set up a camera in my room. Well, first I started building the puppets at, at night from like 10 o'clock until like two or three in the morning, I'd build puppets, really crappy puppets. I had this Muppet uh, book called of Muppets and men. And I would look at the Muppets in there and I try to replicate what I saw there. And I build these really crappy puppets. And then as soon as I got home from school, I'd put up a video camera and practice in my room and how to do the technique. And my parents were like worried about it. They're like, you're not seeing your girlfriend. You're just in your basement all the time. What's happening with you? And I was like, I just want to be a puppeteer. Like, what kind of life is that? Who do, who, what, is, what, how, what kind of living could you make as a puppeteer? And I was like, I, I don't care. I just need to do this. And, and being the age I was, which was either, I think it was 19 or 20. I think it was 19, maybe 20. Um, I, had, I, don't, I would never do this now, but I built really crappy puppets. Then I made it my mission to show them to Jim, <laughs> to say, look, and I got invited back. And I went to, they were shooting a, a Jim Henson hour, actually, the Song of the Cloud Forest. And I went to the Muppet Studios that used to be on 67th Street, 67th Street and 2nd Avenue. And I went there and I was watching. And then in between takes, I was like, Jim, I, I, I don't know if you remember me, but look, I built these puppets. And uh, he was like, oh, very, you know, very nice. And um but Stevie, like Steve Whitmire was the sweetest person. And he was always super supportive of me, Stevie. And he was like, he put one of the puppets on and he encouraged me. And he was like, this is really good. Keep going. So Stevie throughout, like throughout the beginning of my career, Stevie was always the guy to really encourage me and say like, you know, you're, you're doing good. <laughs> 
And your parents are going, don't encourage him. <laughs> don't encourage, please. He's, he's, he needs to be an accountant. I was <laughs> like, yeah, I, I literally was not allowed to go to college for performing. They were like, you were not going to, you're not going to be a performer. You could do that anytime if you're going to college. So I, they were like, well, I better choose a major. What am I going to choose? And I was like, well, I, I was a double majoring. I did theater and I was, what else can I choose? And I was like, economics. That sounds like you make money with economics. I'll, I'll choose economics. <laughs> so I literally, come senior year, I'm taking like economics of Latin American countries. And I'm like, I don't even know what this is. I hate this. I don't want to go anymore. <laughs> But yeah, and I was already working at Sesame at the time. I was like, "Why am I finishing? This is so stupid." <laughs> what? But you ha- do you have that degree to fall back on even now? I do. I got I, you know I went to graduation, and because I was uh, didn't care about school anymore, and I was so want I was busy doing some work at Sesame and not paying attention, I dropped my honors from magna cum laude to cum laude. So they would they said, "Oh, you have to come back for your diploma because we have the wrong honors on there." I said, I, I, "Okay." I, I never went back and I never collected my diploma. So 30 years later, I still do not have that diploma. <laughs> but I did get it. I graduated. Yeah. Stay yeah. in school, kids. For what? <laughs> for Latin America economics. Yeah, that's right. You, you were in one of the uh, Henson workshops, right? I did. I did a uh, Henson workshop with John Kennedy and with uh, Carmen, Carmen Osbar, actually. We were together in our first, our first workshop. Yeah, it was, it was nerve wracking and but really fun. Yeah, well, was I was going to ask? Well, I mean, nerve wracking, but uh, were you terrified or? I was terrified because I had never done puppets in front of anybody. Literally, like a year or not even a not even a year because it must have been like six months after I had started building puppets. I had sent Camille a tape. And she she was dreading it, and then she got it, and she was like, "This is actually pretty good." So she sent it to Kevin, and Kevin invited me. But I had never done a puppet in front of anybody. Um, so I was super nervous, but going, but it was, and I had to go to, I remember I was leaving for Disney world with my then girlfriend's family that night. So I was, I was like, Oh my God, I got to pack my bags and be ready. But it, it was by the end of it, I was like, Oh my God, that was super fun. And I met so many good people like, Oh, Craig Shemin. I don't know if you've ever met Craig, but Craig is a writer for Henson and, and, and works for their archives for years. He was there too, as, as a, doing puppetry as well. So yeah, I met all these great people. Yeah, John Kennedy mentioned that you and him kind of became good friends. Uh, yeah, we did at that, that that workshop was where we met. And in fact, I think it was even that year, or it was either that year or the next year. Um, I remember Kevin asked me if I wanted to audition for Dinosaurs, but I'd have to move to LA and I couldn't do Sesame. And I was like, I don't think I want to do that. I said, but I know a guy. <laughs> and I just was like <laughs> trying to track John down because he was... He lived in Indiana, but he wasn't there. And I was calling all these people around the country trying, John, get to New York. You need to do this audition. So how did you land a, a part on Sesame Street? How did that uh, come about? You know, Kevin Kevin saw something in me that day. Uh, and I think it was because, you know, at the end of the workshop, he just had all the puppeteers do a little message for Jim that Jim would watch, right? And uh, I don't know if Jim ever watched it, but he, we, we were to pick up a puppet and do that. And I remember all... Everybody there was doing like total Sesame Street stuff, uh, like letters and numbers and really kind of kids kids show stuff. And I just decided to just offer dating tips as whatever puppet I was. I was just like how to meet women. And I think Kevin thought that was funny. And he said, well, you know, you, you should come and, uh, and play. And he actually invited me to do a show with him in Baltimore first. I went down and, sh- and shot a, a show called Oh man, if I, Milo's Secret was a reading show at his old at his first station that he worked at. He was he worked at a local station on a kids show, and he wrote he um, created this show and this special for Baltimore. And I went down and lived in his basement for a couple of weeks or, and shot that show. And then he invited me to come into. I think it was there, and he was like, "You're going to do Sesame." And I was like, "Really?" He said, "Yes." So I remember the first time. Yeah. In those days, were you just like kind of background and assist? Background that- and assist. Well, on the first thing I did, I got to put on a puppet. I didn't do assist. It was it was called Wet and Dry. It was a song. And it was these juxtaposing things about uh, people in a desert with dry and, and these sailors on a ship in a, in a storm or, or the waves were coming. I remember, I just remember I had a puppet. I got to sing and do the choreography and there were crew guys with buckets of water, just throwing water at us <laughs> as it was doing. It was a great way to literally be baptized into the, into the sesame. It was great. That's why you got to do it. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, because nobody else wanted to get wet with all those electrical right. stuff. Let this guy do it. No, it was super. <laughs> Kevin was really sweet to let me do that. 
and it was yeah. super fun. How did the transition happen from you going from puppetry to writing on the show? Uh, so writing was never a thing I thought I could do because literally in college, you know, you take, you, you, they place you based on your writing samples. And I got placed in the low because I just had bad grammar. I didn't know the difference between a comma and a semicolon. I was never good at grammar. But at the time, I guess it was like 1991 or 92. I think it's 92 because that's, yeah, 92, they were, you know, Sesame had 110 shows at the time. They would, they would produce 110 shows a year. And um, Lisa Simon, who was a producer of the show, Oh no! So no. First, before Lisa, they told all the puppeteers, "Hey, go to the go to the Henson workshop, and just look through the the drawers and see if you see any puppets and come up with any character and present it to the writers." So David Rudman and I were trying to come up with a new comedy team. We were trying really. They were called Willoughby and Lester, and we were really basing them on old comedy teams. And we just thought we could try to invent a new Burton or anything. It didn't work. We just didn't find it. But on the way to record that, Columbo was still on the air with Peter Falk, and I. I was like, oh, I wonder if I could do this little Columbo. It was like the, a little lamb detective and he solves nursery crimes, like nursery rhyme crimes, like what happened to old Mother Hubbard's bone and stuff like that. So I just did this like little infomercial and I shot it. And at the end of the thing I was doing with Rudman, I shot it. And when we showed the stuff to the writers, uh, Lisa Simon came to me after and we said, that, that was really funny. Do you want to try, you know, you want to audition as a writer? And I was like, just from my experience at school, I was like, no, no, I'm terrible at writing. I'm just not a writer. And she said, well, you know, we pay for the audition. And that, then I was a hungry puppeteer just trying to get a right hand job. So I was like, that sounded terrible. I was getting a right hand job. But uh, I was just trying to get <laughs> right hand work. And when I heard it paid, I was like, oh, yes, then I definitely, I definitely want to do this. I would like very much to do this. And uh, yeah, she let me audition and they liked my audition pieces. And, and And were you at the time you were still puppeteering and also writing on the show with the at yeah, the same time. yeah. I was. Uh, I got to do. I got to do both. You know, I got to. And my first script was terrible. I don't know how I got to do a second script. I remember the first script I wrote was just a, like some sort of a series of. It was before Sesame Street really had an overarching story. Sometimes we did it, but mostly it was just sketches that were six or seven sketches through the hour. And I remember they were terrible. And um, I remember being in the control room. And John Stone was directing. John was a hero of mine. And to make him laugh was like the biggest thing in the world when I had a puppet. If I could make him laugh, that was the ultimate. And I remember he didn't know I was back there. And uh, Ted May, who was his assistant director, said, hey, should we do another one? He goes, no, this shit's not worth it. And I was like, oh, that really hurts. That hurts. (laughs) So from then on, I really worked a lot harder to like, oh, I got to be funnier. I got to be better. What was a traditional week like writing on Sesame Street or, or how, how did you know, the writing it, process it, it, The work? writing process was always, it's not a room. It's not like a sitcom. It's um, very autonomous. You go and you meet with the head writer. You pitch your idea for a show. You get a, you get a curriculum sheet first. Well, we used to. You, I'm not sure if we, now I think we just get the letter and number or I don't do it at all. I do nothing. But I think that's what we, at the end, that's what we were getting. But then it was like a whole curriculum sheet and you had what this episode the letter, the number, and a couple of other things that were going to be taught in this episode. And you tried to come up with a story that was going to uh, fit those, those curriculum goals. And then you'd go and pitch them to the head writer. And then he'd, he'd say, okay, that sounds good. Or he'd say, no, this is terrible. Come back with something else. And you'd go off and you'd write a first draft. We didn't even write outlines at the time. We would just write first drafts and then get notes and then write second drafts. But it was super autonomous. You would only come in maybe once every three or four weeks to meet as a group. And sometimes you'd pit, you'd, you'd say, Hey, I'm working on this. I'm working on this. Hey, we're doing this thing with Elmo or this thing with Grover. And you'd, you'd catch up with each other or they'd say, Hey, this year we're going to do a, an arc where slimy goes to the moon or whatever. But for the most part, you were just, you were left to your own devices and you could write on your own. And, and I like I liked that a lot. I mean, I've had other experiences in the room and the room can be very fun. It's also very, a very slow process of a different way to work. When you were writing and puppeteering, how did you kind of balance those? Um, or, or did you enjoy it? Did you just embrace I it? I did. I enjoyed it. I, I really, you know, we had, the sh- by the time, we always had, I'm trying to think, I'm pretty sure we had everything written by the time we started shooting. And if we didn't, there was like a few scripts left. So I would have, it was great because that would give me work most of the year. You know, we'd, we'd shoot for three months and then I'd go off and meet with the writers and come up with scripts and and then get to be in those scripts, hopefully. So yeah, it was, it was not, it was great. I loved it. 
What are some of your secrets of working sort of educational elements into a script without it being sort of a lecture to the viewers? You know, the the main thing to do is find the character in it is like try to come up with a story that's not about the goal, but is really about a character want and desire and then work that goal into that desire, into that desire. And that's like a key element of and that's still, I still, I still struggle with it now, even when, when I get for, for other stuff and you get it and you go, how do I make this just be about the character and not be didactic? And, but it, it you know, when you do it really well, it's great. It feels awesome. But yeah, I always try to, to, to not hide it, but to make it really be a character piece or make it like a really great parody that you go, oh, that's a really funny way to teach taking turns, or whatever. According to the timeline I found on the internet, uh, the Columbo piece was like around 1992. Yeah. And then in 1993, you won the first of many Emmy Awards that uh, you would win. Yeah, I got to win a bunch of Emmy Awards uh, for, for being on the show. I, I don't know. I gave up. I don't, I don't have them all. I gave a bunch away to, like, to family members when I would win. After I had like one or two, I was like, I'm going to give this to my grandpa. He could put it on his shelf and my grandma and my <laughs> uncle. But I won in the twenty something in the twenties, and I won a bunch for writing. I won one for performing, which was I was really proud of that one, and a bunch for directing, and then one for a songwriting, which again I was really proud of that one because <laughs> like I was like ah I get to write, and I love writing songs, so I was really proud yeah. of that one. Do you have a musical background? I, I mean, I was in like you know I was a drummer in terrible bands when I was in high school and then I was a drummer in better bands when I was older I was just not good <laughs> they were better than me but in terms of musical no I, in ter- except I did musicals when I was younger and I'm married to a musical theater person and I love music and I love songwriting but I, I do remember Jeff Moss who was like the ultimate songwriter and um, I love I don't want to live on the moon so 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 much and he wrote that and i remember telling him in the 90s like i had written a song and he complimented me i said well i just like i you know i look at i don't want to live on the moon and i want to someday write something as good as that i still haven't but he was like well you're on your way and i was like oh that's like the best thing i could hear um yeah so yeah i've always always wanted to write a great lyric yeah well, I would love to talk just briefly about a couple of the no. characters you played on Stess. No, okay, I won't fine. Tell, no, okay, I'll do it. Interview over. <laughs> you could t- ask me. Ask me anything, Grant. Uh, Stinky the Stinkweed. Yes, is a hilarious I character. I love him. I love Stinky. He's a little bit of a ripoff. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Was the character based on someone? <laughs> he is based on someone. Uh, so I always loved. Well, actually, Norman Stiles, the head writer, introduced me. Uh, to the 2000 year old man. He told me to go find those albums. And when we were coming up with Stinky, the 2000 year old man had great bits about him being a a parent and guilting his kids into doing stuff. And I said, well, wouldn't it be hilarious if we have this plant who can't go anywhere? He's always (laughs) stuck in the dirt. So he guilts you into staying with him. It's all right, Grant, you go, go live your life. I'll be here in the dirt with the worms. No, 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 I'm fine, you go. You're so nice to think of me, but please go. You know, and just like totally yield people into this thing. So he's a bit of a rip off on Mel Brooks, but uh, I just love him. Well, I'm glad I asked, because that is yeah. excellent he, he, he was, backstory. He, yeah. he was just, and he was built like as a one-time grouch plant. He literally was built as a one-time <laughs> grouch plant. And I was like, I need to do something with that guy. And I was supposed to be David playing the grouch plant and he, he couldn't make it. He got sick or something. And I got to do the grouch plant. And I remember going to them and saying, we got to do something with this plant. He's hilarious. And he was built for one show and we got to use him many, many times. He's, yeah. He's, he's it's apart and he's like, such he's a fun cool character. Yeah. I love him. He's one of my favorites of all time. Uh, the other one I want to ask was Horatio the elephant. Cause it was a full body character. Yeah. He, he didn't start off that way. They built the legs a couple of like seasons after I started doing them. Cause so he was like dressed as a ballerina or something. And I was like, well, we should see the legs. <laughs> like we want to, <laughs> I want to dance with this thing. And that, that was amazing. Cause they took a puppet that was actually built to be horizontal, to be a horizontal elephant. And then they uh, adapted it and let me be able to work standing. So it was, he was, He's hilarious and great. Again and again, I can rip off of Bobcat a little bit. <laughs> I'm just doing my best Bobcat Goldwing. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, you know, he's such an excitable personality. And- yes, he is. I love to perform. <laughs> he's the best. 
performing in that suit. How did you not get injured or did you get injured running around in that? No, thing? I, I, I did not. It's funny. I was talking to Matt recently, Matt Vogel, and he, he said he's always so careful in, uh, in Big Bird when he's in there. Cause he doesn't want to like, you know, you don't, you have limited sight lines and, and um, I could barely see out of the thing, but I did, I, I was just like, I, I would just go rampaging through the set because I was so, <laughs> there was so much freedom in that thing. And like, I could kick my legs up and I could make this thing be fully alive. And I was, it was great. Sometimes I forgot that there'd be a rod attached to his trunk sometimes. And I'd whip it around and wind up giving somebody a black and blue on their arm <laughs> or something. But yeah, I love that. <clears throat> I love the freedom of a, of a full body. Well, it, when I was researching for this show, there was even a clip on YouTube of, I think it was from like CBS Saturday morning or something like that, oh, where you yeah, bring the camera. Thing. They stuck it. They, they, they gave him a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like a, a an elephantoscopy they stuck the puppet yeah. they stuck the thing in the puppet i've not even seen that is that around like i could see you could, yeah i can send you the link it's on, it's on youtube that, yeah. but i remember them sticking a camera inside when i was in there yeah um, but it was just funny because you're very you were very much like horatio in that moment with like here's all the stuff it's all you know <laughs> well, I was in inside. that confined I was, little space i was living yeah. i was living in his soul <laughs> do you have a preference for full body puppets over hand puppets no, I really love all puppets. I prefer to have a live hand just because it, especially I just love to interact and touch stuff and, and grab things. It just makes the comedy. It's it's makes the comedy be a little more in the moment. And I don't have to think about, okay, I put my rod hand here and we stop tape and I glue the thing, you know, I put tape on it and grab it that way. I just love being able to grab props and, and, and go. So yeah. I do. I love that. Anything that makes it a little more immediate, a little more alive. I love it. Well, and of course, I have to ask you about Murray. How did the character of Murray develop? Uh, Murray was um, Murray's interesting. It's, it's it's a lot that goes into Murray because um, at the time, they liked what I used to do with um, improving with kids. They thought I was good at it, uh, but I didn't have a main character who could do it. So it was a healthy, happy, happy, healthy eating season. Like that was our big curriculum. So um, the executive producer at the time, they would have me interview people as a broccoli as a puppet broccoli and it was fine but i was like who really wants to be interviewed by as by a broccoli right you know you don't really want to talk and bare your soul to a broccoli um but it was all about healthy eating and i guess it worked for that at that time i got asked to go to um to cairo to teach um to help teach egyptian writers how to write sesame so i flew out to cairo and i'm in a meeting and they bring out some of the puppets from their show and one of them was phil phil and it's this beautiful puppet much like murray has this great jaw with this underbite that gives him a, a natural smile and i just fell in love with that look it's still a beautiful puppet a couple of months later we're in new york and new puppets get delivered to the sesame street set and jason is un unboxing them and taking them out and i see uh, an orange one it's phil phil was purple but i see an orange one based on that same pattern and I said, oh, my God, what is this being used for? They said, we don't know. It's just going to be an anything Muppet right now. And I ran to Kevin. I said, Kev, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but please don't give that puppet to anybody yet. I want to figure out what to do with it. And he said, okay. A couple of weeks later, I had to interview people as a broccoli again. And I went to the producer and I said, guys, can I please just do the interview with this character? I don't know who he is, but can we do it? And they said, yeah, if you want to try it, we'll try it. So <clears throat> they let me take it and I put it on. And literally the first kid who's going to do the interview is coming out. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't even have a name for it. Who, what is it going to be named? And there's a, <clears throat> an old guy on the set, a visitor, and he says, well, he's furry. Name him Murray. And I was like, that's, that was my grandfather's name. And I was like, yes, that's going to be his name. So he was named on the spot, and we just started interviewing. <laughs> and then he just kind of grew, and he, for a while he became like a, a little bit of a de facto host because he was doing all those street pieces out in uh, – and in, in that was like this connective tissue throughout the show of just cutting through the street and Murray talking to real kids around New York. So it was, I love that character. He was, he really is my heart. I want, I wish I had that puppet. <clears throat> He's the one that I miss the most. How was it sort of decided that he would be this character that would leave Sesame Street and be out in the world? It, it grew, it grew a little by little. There was a, uh, I'm trying to think what department it was. It was like the publicity department wanted to do something with vocabulary and have it be on the streets of New York. And the producer said to them, well, Joey's really good at improv. You should let him do Murray outside. So we just started shooting around New York City, just doing the word on the street. And that became an intro to a bunch of shows 
I don't know what season it was, maybe 39. And they were just word on the street pieces. And we would do for many seasons. We did maybe four or five seasons. We did word on the streets where we get 26 vocabulary words. We'd go out on the street and talk to kids and they'd edit them together to do these little vocabulary pieces at the end. But they started the first year as a publicity thing to teach kids vocabulary. And then at the same time that those were getting, those were on air and, and people liked them. They were starting to think about an, how we were going to do the show season 40 or 41. It might've been 40. And we were really thinking about doing it in blocks. There'd be the Elmo block and there'd be the street story block and there'd be an Abbey flying fairy school block. And I think super Grover 2.0. So there were like these four cornerstones to the show. And they thought we really should have a host that kind of throws to these things. And because it was already at the top for the word on the street, they said, well, let's try it with Murray as being the host. And we'll just do throws with real kids around New York. And, and we'll have, we'll open it up more than vocabulary. It was, years of doing STEM, which I didn't even know what STEM meant, but it was like we would do science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, we started talking to kids and doing experiments with kids around the city. And then we'd throw to, uh, okay, Super Grover 2.0 is coming up next. And we made it more like interstitials. So yeah, that's how he kind of developed. When you were when you were out on the street with the kids, were those kids just random kids off the street, or were they all kind of cast? No, mostly all real people. They would um, they were never cast. If it was anything, we'd like if we were worried about a location because it wasn't near a lot of foot traffic. They'd they'd go to a school and say, "Hey, we have um, we're shooting some Sesame. Can you just send a couple of classes down, and we're going to interview a bunch of kids?" And then when we started doing the science thing, we'd go and visit we get schools, we get schools to come in and do experiments, but they were never, ever, ever cast. Well, Murray also had a little segment called Murray had a little lamb. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I forgot about those. Yes. Those, th those were in there. I think they might've been before he hosted. It became Murray has a little lamb. Those were another segment of the show. Yeah. That was yeah. And, well, and they, I, I, you know, I'm, I wasn't watching Sesame Street at the time. <laughs> I was a little old, but I just discovering these segments leading up to preparing for this interview. They just look so much fun from a puppetry standpoint because you're throwing that lamb around and yeah. he's, the, the, you know, she's bashing into Murray and all this. It just looked like, it almost looked like Sesame Street, let them do this. You yeah. know, like. <laughs> it was, well, first of all, we would just go out to these locations. Like they, they were all schools and we would, we would scout the schools beforehand and go, okay, we're going to do ice skating school. We're going to do Irish step dancing school. But we didn't figure out, we never figured out how we were going to do stuff once we got the kids in there or what we were going to do. Cause we would watch the kids do their thing and then figure out, okay, how can we replicate this a little bit with the puppets and like ice skating. I remember ice skating school was super fun because we watched the kids skate and go, and we had the skates for Murray and had his legs. And I was like, how are we going to do this? And I remember the crew just put this like, these put together this little dolly and they were wheeling me around on the dolly and I was, you know, putting the skates on and they were, we, and somebody, the camera guy was on there with me. It was super fun. I loved doing that. that. And it was just me, Matt, Carmen, and like Peter Linz or John Kennedy, just four of us out there just throwing puppets and doing wild crap. And, and my favorite is Lin-Manuel Miranda sings the theme song for that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. So before yeah. he was singing about <laughs> Hamilton, he was singing about Murray. <laughs> Murray, uh, as you mentioned, you like live hand puppets. Did you have a regular assist with Murray? Um, for those, I mean, I know Peter did a bunch of them. Matt did a bunch for me early on. John Kennedy did some for me. Stephanie DeBruzzo came in a couple of times and helped me. But yeah, you know, I, I would, you know, I, I love working with all those people. They're great, you know. So anybody that we've, I worked so long with so many of those people like we are. I'll, I'll do right hands for them. They'll do right hands for me. And we just can figure out how to do stuff really well together. Well, in 2010, you wrote a song called I Love My Hair. Yes. And uh, you that it went of, it was a kind of a viral hit, viral yes. sensation. Can you tell us the story about uh, I Love My Hair? Yeah. So I, I have two kids. They're, at the time, I had one, Segi, and she's um, adopted from Ethiopia. And at the time, you know, both my wife and I are white and she's black. And I, at the time, I remember her putting towels on her hair and pretending she had long hair and really wanting to play with my wife's hair. And, uh, at, and about that time too, Chris Rock's film, I think it's called Good Hair, came out. And I thought, well, this is an issue. I thought it was because it was just my kid was um, an African-American child growing up with white parents. And I, after I heard about the Chris Rock's thing, I said, oh, actually, wait, this is a cultural thing. 
And black girls go through this throughout their whole life where they feel like they have to change their hair and stuff. So I asked the producer, we were already set to shoot. It was an insert day and I was directing and I said, you know, I really want to write this song for my daughter called I Love My Hair. Uh, and, and can I just, can we, can we write it and try to shoot it on this day? And she said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So I got to write it. Uh, I wrote the lyric and Chris Jackson, the amazing Chris Jackson, who played Washington in Hamilton. He was in the original In the Heights. Uh, he wrote the music for it and uh, we were able to shoot it on that day. And I should have realized that something was up on the day we shot it. All the African-American women who worked on in the office or on the crew, they kind of came around to watch it being shot, but I didn't think anything of it. It started to air. I think it might've gone online first because Sesame was like putting stuff up online and, um, or maybe it aired on TV. I was sitting in my office and my assistant called and said, there's somebody on the line for you. She says she's a New York state Senator. And I said, yeah, okay. And it turns out this woman was a, uh, either she was a state Senator or she worked for the Senator and she was an African-American woman in her fifties. And she said, she saw the, the um, piece and it meant so much to her. And, um, and then all of a sudden it's just started to grow and grow and become this viral thing. And uh, it was a really awakening for me because I had written for the show for so long. And I always really thought, Oh, you know, I'm teaching letters and numbers. And it was the first time I thought, wow, I could, you can actually this Sesame and, and Sesame's use of, of the web really could have a bigger effect and a bigger, I should really think about what I want to say and wh- how I want to make the world a better place or, or help um, kids in the world. It, it really opened my eyes to like the reach of Sesame and that still had the reach. Cause I thought, Oh, it had the reach when I was a kid, but does it still have the reach and our kids, do people care? It really was a big um, awakening for me to go, wow, this is a, a really powerful Sesame is a powerful thing to use and, and, and have the privilege of being at work there. Yeah. Well, as we, as we wrap up talking about Sesame street, I would love to ask, I never got to meet, Jerry Nelson, but of course was a fan of his. I would love to get your thoughts on working with him on Sesame Street. I mean, Jerry is another one like Richard, another amazing performer that I always, always, always looked up to because he could do a million voices and he was always funny. And he was always just in the moment and a great actor. I was, I, you know, to be a Richard or to be a Jerry, that's like the thing you strive for. Right. Uh, and Jerry was the coolest guy in the world. Like just I mean, he is the epitome of cool and you just want to hang out with him, go out for a drink with him, hear him play his guitar. I used to play his guitar in the Muppet Room and have these songs that I had never heard. And, you know, he would play old blues songs or really funny songs. And, and also he loved back in the day, he loved the Nintendo. We had a Nintendo in the, uh, in the Muppet Room and he'd play like Tetris for hours on end. He was like a Tetris master. He, he was like, he was one of a kind. That guy is the best. So I, I, what a privilege to be able to have worked with him for so many years. Yeah. Well, somebody else you got to work with going back a little bit in 1999 was I heard that you wrote a version of the Muppets from Space script with uh, Jerry Jewell. <laughs> well, I actually d- didn't get to work with Jerry because Jerry had, I had written, I guess I had written Elmo and Grouchland first and we were making that. I had, I had done the, the draft that got the green light and then Jerry's script wasn't it wasn't going forward or was having trouble and they they asked me because i had written the sesame one if i would take a look at it and what i would do with it and i just i read it and i i said well these are the things i would do and they said okay go and take a pass at it and i did a pass at it and um i wound up getting the green light but i never got to work with jerry and i didn't know jerry very well and it was not um i think jerry was upset and after years later when i'd seen him not that many years later it must have been maybe 2 years later i think it was actually a party for jerry nelson and i went to him and i said look i didn't know you know i didn't know that you didn't know that i was writing it and i'm so sorry but he was very upset and then it turned out to me to be a terrible experience because i had gotten the green light and we were going to it was going to be directed by a guy named randall Kleiser who directed greece and I loved Greece, and I was like, "This is amazing!" And I met Randall, and I was so excited. And it was really kind of full of parodies, and like had parodies of Alien, and had parodies of X Files, which was on TV at the time, and all these kind of great space alien parodies. And Contact, which was out, they they came. They called me one day. We were so, I was supposed to go out for a read through, and they called me and said, "Oh, uh, big changes. We fired Randall." And I'm like, "Wait, what? Why would you fire Randall? Like, we, we got the green light, and he seemed great, and he knew what he was doing. No, no, we don't. He's not bringing enough to the table. So we brought a new director, and I don't remember his name. Uh, they brought in a new director, and all of a sudden, I kept getting drafts 
with my name still on it, but they weren't my drafts. And I was like, wait, this is getting to be not, uh, not because originally too, my, my draft was Gonzo is out there trying to find his family and you find all these Gonzos out on another planet. And then at the end, it reveals that they're actually just huge fans and replicate, like have caught, like made them their features to look like Gonzo, but they peel back and they're horrible aliens, not <laughs> evil, but just horrible looking aliens. And he doesn't have a family. They're just, they were getting these kind of Muppet shows broadcast out in space and fell in love with Gonzo and wanted to be like him. So uh, the end, the end thing was like, it, you know, the Muppets are his family and it's, he's not an alien. The Muppets are just his family. And that is what I wanted to end with. I was like, that, cause that's to me an important message, like the, the family you choose, right? Not, it's not your genetics, but then all of a sudden that all got changed. And it was, he was an alien and it was, it was not as the, all the parody stuff was going away. And I was like, this isn't mine. And at the time I had just worked on Elmo and Grouchland and Mandy Potenkin was in Elmo and Grouchland and Mandy lived in on the upper West side where I lived. And one day I'm out there and I'm, I just had gotten another draft that I was so upset about. And I, I see Mandy goes, oh, come to lunch with me. So we went to this uh, restaurant in our neighborhood and sat down and I'm telling him what happened. He goes, you should just quit. I said, really? You think I should quit? He goes, you should quit. What? You're never going to work on another movie again? Quit. And I was like, yeah, it's a great idea, Mandy. I'm going to quit. <laughs> so I called him up and said, I'm, I'm off. I, I'm quitting. I'm leaving the movie. And uh, Grant asked me how many movies I worked on since then. <laughs> Joey, how many movies have you worked on since then? None! I've not worked on any! <laughs> Never listen to Mandy Patekin for your advice. Don't do it! <laughs> no, he's Mandy's awesome. I was just like, it was yeah. not great advice for me. But I was glad I didn't work on it because I was not happy with that film. I actually, I fought really hard for my credit on Sesame, the Sesame movie. And when that, I got a credit on that movie and I was like, I don't care if I have a credit on that movie. I didn't love that movie. Well, I, I, w- I was going to ask this, and, and I'm not asking for for details, but it, it kind of is the same the same idea about quitting the the thing, and, but about leaving Sesame Street. Yeah. How? And I know that that's a huge decision, especially if something you've worked on for so long. How do you sort of take care of yourself mentally when you make a big decision like that? Because for performers, that kind of comes up every now and then, where you just have to say, "Look, I'm not going to do this anymore." It was hard. It was a hard. I mean, it was, it was not all my decision. It was, it was like a mutual, we were not, we just weren't gelling. The new, the new people took over at Sesame and they're the well-meaning and well-intentioned, but it was definitely not what I saw for the show. It was, there was one meeting when they said, um, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to aim for the adult in the room anymore. And I was like, well, that's who we are. Like we try to work on two levels and it just was like a year of, of not working. Like uh, I, you know, we just didn't see eye to eye, but leaving was, uh, it was tough because being, being the Sesame street person in any, wherever you go, you're like the Sesame street guy. Hey, that's the guy. And he's, and it becomes so part of your identity. Then when it's gone, it's like, wait, who am I? Then If I'm not the Sesame guy, who am I? It was hard to work through. I'm not going to lie. It was a, it was a rough time. Uh, but, you know, thank God I was also, you know, Seggy and Samaya's dad. So I was like, well, that's who I am. Like, that's my, you know, that's who's important. And that's what I have to um, focus on. And it's not about Sesame. And I had, I had 26 great years there. Well, I had 25 great years and then one not so great year. So, but it was, it was, you know, how, how lucky am I that I got to be there for, you know, a quarter of a century. It's crazy. Who gets yeah, to do that? Yeah, yeah really. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like, you know what the office is a popular show right. nine it, years, eight or nine years. So, so, so yeah, yeah, I got to, and I got to do everything I got to, by the end I was getting to, you know, I was directing shows I was writing and head writing. And I just felt like this independent studio and I was getting to do kind of everything I wanted with puppets and it was great. So I'm super thankful for everything and every person I met there. They're all great. So it yeah, was all, it was a great, great time there. In 2018, you performed as part of the Puppets for Puppetry event tribute to Carol Spinney. Oh my God, and you right. performed. I did do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that, but yes, I did. Well, I wanted to ask this because uh, those things are not, I mean, maybe they're filmed, but they're not kind of available for the public to see. You did sort of a clown tribute to Carol for his time on, on Bozo the Clown. Can you tell us a bit about that piece and what you did? I didn't, you know, I was just there as a performer. I was actually out there because I was working on Kidding at the time. And, uh, it was out in LA at the Henson lot and they asked, would you do it? And I hadn't seen Carol in years. And I really just wanted to go and see Carol. Cause I had known he wasn't, uh, 
doing that well and I wanted to see him. So I did it, but it was written. I don't remember who wrote it. I may have been Craig that wrote it. I'm not sure, but it was, yeah, it was just like they were doing snippets of Carol's life and about meeting Debbie and about meeting Jim and about starting on Sesame Street and about his time in Bozo the Clown. But honestly, I don't even, I remember had a puppet, a clown puppet. I don't remember the details of it, but I just remember it kind of, Jack McBrayer, I think, played Carol uh, and it was just taking us through Carol's life with puppets. That's fun. Yeah, it's a fun little. It was fun. And the best part is I got to see Carol and it was the last time I saw him in person. I'd spoken to him, I think one more time after on the phone, but it was the last time I had seen him. Uh, So it was, thank God I got to do that because, uh, you know, to have some goodbye to him. To, yeah. So, I mean, I remember being in college, I went to Fordham on the Upper West Side and, and I had visited Sesame already and, and I would see riding down Ninth Avenue on this little port, like this little fold up bike was, there was Carol Spinney. I'm going, there's like, this is before Elmo was hugely popular. And I was like, there's like the most famous guy in children's television and nobody knows it. <laughs> he is <laughs> just riding down Ninth Avenue. Well, nowadays you're working on Don Quixote. I am on the on the pbs show and uh you appeared in an episode as game show gator is one of the perks of being a writer on the show that you get to come up with characters that you would be perfect for um you know for game show gator uh, i didn't even know i would be performing it it is good i mean i just like creating characters but david was david and adam were both like uh, adam rudman who's david's brother and co-created the show they just thought i would be good for it but i couldn't go out to do it, it was you know during the pandemic, and I couldn't go out to Chicago, so they just let me loop it. But I'm dying for the oh. day when now that we can fly again, that the next game show Gator show comes up, so I can actually fly and put a puppet on. Because I miss having a puppet on my arm. I literally, when I get to put a puppet, I did. Uh, Mo Willems did a a, a show in in uh, at, the, at the Kennedy Center in D.C. two years ago, and he let me play a, a version of Pigeon, a puppet version of Pigeon, in this kind of improv show that was um, on HBO actually. Oh, we did it live in front of an audience. And I literally felt like Sweeney Todd when I had a puppet. And I was like, at last, my arm is complete again. Um, I miss, you know, I love writing, but man, I miss having a puppet on my arm. Well, and you did. <laughs> so uh, it was such like just a quick thing. But on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, yeah. the Papaza, was the, that pupaza. the name of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Papaza, the, 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 uh, the, the great grandmother of the character or something. Yeah, that was super Yeah, fun. how did that come up? Was that an audition or somebody just asked no, you to do I, it? No, you know, I, I met Tina from doing Sesame years ago and, and our kids hung out when, when they were little. And uh, then I, I know Carlock through Tina who, who created the show with her. I think it was Carlock just called me and said, hey, you want to do this thing? And I said, <laughs> yeah, sure. Because I had done, I'd done 30 Rock once with them where where – I can't even remember his name. The um, Jack McBrayer's Kenneth, where he saw everything he saw was um, he thought it was Muppets. So we got to do that. So I, uh, yeah, yeah. Anytime they call me, I said yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, getting back to sort of Don Quixote here for a second, you've you've written for a lot of properties that have established characters like this Don Quixote and the yeah. Muppets and Sesame Street. How do you create something new yet kind of pay tribute to what has come before when you're writing for characters like that? You know, you you just kind of steep yourself in whatever that that's available. With Don Quixote, it's a little different. It's um, David and Adam really are reinventing those characters because they were the lesser, I think, lesser known, at least to me. I didn't know Don Quixote and Bob Dog and those characters. So they're sort of doing a new thing with them. And Donkey is actually, Grant Quixote is is actually supposed to be Don Quixote from Mr. Rogers' time. And then Donkey is his granddaughter. So she's a different character completely. But I like I bought, there's a great Fred Rogers book and I, I read about Bob Dog and I read about Purple Panda and, you know, as much as I could and found out what a little bit about them and then and then start writing. But with the Muppets, yeah. a little different. Like I really steep myself in watching as much as I can for those characters because you just want to, for any writer who's going to join any show, whether it be a sitcom or Sesame Street or anything, just get to know those voices. You know, you want to know those voices so they're just naturally going to come out of you. Was there anything on Sesame Street like, because you did so many shows on Sesame Street, so I'm assuming that there's not, but maybe there is, but like it's a Bible and it's like, oh, well, uh, Murray was an ice, you know, went ice skating here. So there's no, 10 years from there's now, there's no you know. comprehensive Bible like that. It says, I mean, there, occasionally we would be asked as writers to go, okay, write the, you know, give us new character descriptions of the characters, but there's no sort of thing that says everything that's over the 50 year history of everything. It would just be impossible. <laughs> Even now with the newer shows, I'm always like, Hey, we need to, we need to figure out everything. Cause again, writing for Don Quixote, we don't sit in a room and we're not watching every episode. I said, we should just, 
we got to find out, like have a little Bible to say, okay, Don, uh, you know, like a purple panda loves this and donkey loves this. So, so the new writers can have an idea, but it's, it's hard, you know, Bibles that are around when a show started are just kind of worthless after season one because <laughs> they change right, so right. much, you know, you have to yeah. adapt it. Well, as we wrap up here, I always like to ask what has been the highlight of your puppetry career so far? Oh man, the highlight of my puppetry career. That is a great one. The highlight of my puppetry career. All right, this is, this is, it's not exact. There's so many highlights, but this is one of my favorite moments. So I was doing Murray and interviewing uh, an older kid. She's probably eight or nine. And before we start, she says to me, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to reveal your secret. I said, well, what secret is that? that? That you are under there doing Murray. I said, well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. We start the interview and, you know, these were Murray interviews. So they would just be random topics and you're trying to get stuff for a bunch of different shows and stuff. And I'm just talking to her and having fun and we're fooling around. And uh, at one point she turns to Murray, she says, can you come to my house and have a play date? And Murray's like, yeah, I would love to come to your house. She goes, I'll be great. And you can meet my friend, this and this. And I just, she was totally, you know, she knew t- 10 minutes before she knew I was down there and she knew my secret, but here she was just totally engaged with this character and wanted it to come to her house. And I was like, okay, that is the magic of puppets and everything that I love about puppets is like, you know, as a grown up or even as a kid, you know, there's somebody under there, but the magic of puppetry is it is the alchemy of a puppeteer's hand goes in there and the spirit from here goes into that and it just becomes alive and that was the epitome of everything I love about puppets. Awesome. Well, Joey, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate oh, my it. My pleasure, Grant. Thanks for talking to me. It was awesome. My thanks to Joey Mazzarino for being on the show. For links to some of the things we talked about on this episode, check out the show notes for episode number 62 over at underthepuppet.com. Special thanks to Kevin Clash for putting me in touch with Joey Mazzarino for this episode. Well, now it's time to announce the winner of episode 61's giveaway for a brand new copy of Mervyn Miller's book, Puppetry, How to Do It. The question was, whose resignation caused a quick breakaway moment during one of Otis the Aardvark's daily TV shows? And the answer was Prime Minister John Major. And the winner is Roos Boosks. Congratulations, your book is on the way. This episode, we're going to give away a puppet. Well, technically, it's a flat-footed frizzle puppet handmade by Under the Puppet guest David Stevens of All Hands Productions. To be entered to win this one-of-a-kind flat-footed frizzle puppet in Under the Puppet Orange, all you have to do is answer this question from the episode you just heard. What puppet was Joey Mazzarino using to interview people before he got Murray? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by August 15th, 2021. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the September 1st, 2021 episode of the show. One entry per household. Good luck. And to see a picture of the flat-footed frizzle you can win, check out the show notes for this episode over at underthepuppet.com. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I would like to send a special thank you out to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who help make this show possible. Patreon patrons at the producer level and above who get a special shout out are Vicki Sebring, David Akers, Tony Urbano, Kathy Crawford, Eve Cunning, and my great aunt Dorothy Pachoco. To become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604 or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send questions and comments via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com or you can connect with the show on Instagram or Twitter by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet was edited by Stephen Staver and features music by Dan Ring. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and help spread the word by sharing your favorite Under the Puppet episode with a friend. Under the Puppet is copyright 2021 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer, all rights reserved www.saturdaymorningmedia.com
Under the Puppet proudly presents the adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90 minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never before seen artwork and exclusive behind the scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned, we'll be right back.